Imagine that you're a well-respected and celebrated movie director, known for producing several works of art throughout your career. Now, imagine that the release of one of these films has been blamed for inspiring several gruesome acts of violence committed in the real world. This scenario was exactly the case for director Stanley Kubrick with the release of his film A Clockwork Orange, based on the 1962 novel of the same name. The film has been cited as being the cause of many crimes since its release in 1971, some of which have occurred even decades after it was first shown to audiences. Before I can go in depth about these controversies and crimes, however, you first need to understand the plot of the film that allegedly caused them. Spoilers ahead, obviously. The film opens with a boy named Alex DeLarge and his friends, referred to as his droogs, sitting in a bar that serves milk laden with drugs. Alex and his droogs often spend their nights causing mayhem in the streets of Britain, in bouts of what they refer to as ultraviolence. A series of these acts of sex and violence, paired with disagreements between the boys themselves, result in the death of a woman by the hand of Alex. As the police arrive, his droogs betray him, abandoning him at the scene of the crime, and Alex is sentenced to 14 years in prison. After spending two years of his sentence in prison, Alex volunteers to be a test subject in an experimental form of aversion therapy with the hope of shortening his sentence in the process. Unfortunately for Alex, this therapy forces him to watch films depicting acts of violence and sex while injected with a drug that produces feelings of terror and sickness. Now, because of these torturous experiments, Alex develops a violent reaction when exposed to sex or violence. The therapy worked. Released from prison, Alex finds that the world has moved on without him. The police have sold his belongings as compensation to Alex's victims, his parents have rented out his room to another boy, and his old droogs have now become policemen, who use their power to assault him. Mentally and physically defeated, Alex stumbles upon the home of one of his past victims. The man doesn't recognize Alex at first, as the boy had worn a mask when they'd first met, and he agrees to help him. This stroke of luck doesn't last forever, though, and upon finally realizing who Alex was, the man drugs him and forces him into a locked room. Alex, once again experiencing feelings of terror and sickness from his therapy, leaps from the window in an effort to finally end his suffering. Alex wakes up a while later in the hospital and discovers that his aversions to sex and violence have now disappeared. The film closes with Alex in a hospital bed, the man regaining his old violent ways while retaining his newfound freedom. In his own words, he was cured all right. Based off of the summary alone, you probably have an idea as to why this film was so controversial. Alex, our extremely violent protagonist, is a murderer and a rapist, and yet is still released at the end of the film with almost no punishments. Even worse, in many ways, the film tries to make you feel bad for Alex, such as when his friends betray him or when he's tortured through his therapy. At the surface level, while these reasons could explain why the film was as controversial as it was, the general reception of the film was, and still is, mostly positive. In reality, the controversial life of A Clockwork Orange started because of the many copycat crimes that followed its release. In May of 1973, the Daily Mail reported that a group of teenage boys in Merseyside, England murdered a 50-year-old firewood seller. The paper referred to the boys as a Clockwork Orange gang, and they were believed to have been wearing clothing that resembled those worn by Alex and his droogs. Similarly, in July of the same year, the Daily Mail reported on the case of Richard Palmer, a 16-year-old boy in Bletchley, England. In its story titled, Why Clockwork Orange Boy Murdered a Tramp, the paper discussed the crimes of Palmer, who, as the title implies, murdered a homeless man in the town of Bletchley. Palmer's crime parallels a famous scene from early in the film, where Alex and his droogs assault a homeless man beneath a bridge. In Lancashire, England, a 17-year-old girl vacationing from the Netherlands was raped by a gang of boys who allegedly sang Singing in the Rain while the crime was committed. This crime, once again, parallels a scene from earlier in the film, in which Alex and his droogs assault and rape the wife of the same man who would end up helping Alex later in the film. These are just a small handful of the crimes that A Clockwork Orange was blamed for having inspired. I could continue to list off these crimes for you, but in all honesty, the details of the crimes themselves are in a way irrelevant to the main point of this controversy. While the crimes that were committed were tragic for every victim involved, the specifics of the violence itself did not matter to those who wished to blame A Clockwork Orange, so long as they could find a way to relate it to the film. In order to attempt to analyze a crime, a jury needs to have at least an idea as to what motivated a criminal to commit their crime, especially when the act is as unprovoked as murdering a homeless man or a friend. In some court cases, this motivation to randomly hurt others is carelessly placed solely on violent media such as A Clockwork Orange. You can still see decisions like this being made today, such as modern media blaming violent video games for real-life violence. Unfortunately for artists like Kubrick, representations of violence in our media is a very easy scapegoat to get behind, and many people in the general public were quick to blame A Clockwork Orange for these crimes taking place. 
People were so angry, in fact, that protesters began to crowd outside of Kubrick's home in hopes of the director taking responsibility for what happened. During an interview, Kubrick, who was typically non-contentious towards criticisms of his work, said this, I know there are well-intentioned people who sincerely believe that films and TV contribute to violence, but almost all of the official studies of this question have concluded that there is no evidence to support this view. At the same time, I think the media tend to exploit the issue because it allows them to display and discuss the so-called harmful things from a lofty position of moral superiority. Kubrick went on to compare the incrimination of his film to the Salem Witch Trials, and believed that criminals and their lawyers only wished to use a clockwork orange as an excuse. Even still, in 1973, it was Kubrick's decision himself to pull a clockwork orange from circulation in the United Kingdom. While Kubrick did not necessarily agree with the media or the courts, he decided that banning his own film was the right choice to make. The film would remain out of circulation in the UK until Kubrick's death in the year 2000. Personally, I am of the belief that violent media such as films or video games do not make much of an impact in terms of crime rates. Similarly, violent works of art, such as in literature, are not blamed nearly as much as films are, while some writings can be just as violent as their visual counterparts. To be fair to those who do believe that media can greatly inspire the crimes of real people, visual media like TV and film may be easier to inspire the average person to commit a crime than a book would, if only marginally. The fact that a person can physically see the violence or the gore, or whatever the case may be, could cause them to subconsciously interpret the violence as being more real than that from a book, for instance. In my opinion, however, I don't think that this difference in form matters as much as some people would believe. Any sane human would be able to view an interpretation of fictional violence and be able to separate it from reality in their minds, regardless of whether it's on a page or a screen. I believe that any person who would dare blame a work of fictional art as the reason for their crimes are either insane or grasping for a court verdict in their favor. In other words, the crimes that were supposedly inspired by A Clockwork Orange would almost certainly have happened anyway, perhaps in a different form or a different time, even if the film had never been created in the first place. Even in the specific cases of the crimes I mentioned earlier are there discrepancies in the idea that A Clockwork Orange was to blame for them happening. In the case of Richard Palmer, for example, the boy had actually never seen the film. Though he had read the book, his mother claimed that it hadn't affected him in any major way. Additionally, in the case of the so-called Clockwork Orange gang that killed the firewood seller, the only evidence linking the film to the crime was the fact that the film had played recently in the nearby cinema, and the fact that teenagers in the area had reportedly purchased clothing similar to those worn by Alex and his droogs. The contents of violent films being irrelevant to real-life crimes isn't just my opinion, however, and is in fact a studied area of psychology by many people. In their essay, Does Movie Violence Increase Violent Crime, Gordon Dahl and Stefano de Levigna record data regarding how violent crime is affected by violent movies. Through their research, the men found three main effects. Firstly, violent movies significantly reduce violent crimes in the evening on the day of exposure. Secondly, by an even larger percent, it reduces violent crime during the night hours following exposure. And finally, it has no significant impact in the days and weeks following the exposure. This research further proves my point, as the lack of an increase in crime after watching violent films negates the claims made by those who believe that movies are to blame for violence. I don't think blaming A Clockwork Orange, or any media in general, for inspiring real-life crimes is very fair to anyone involved in the process. It's unfair to the artists, it's unfair to the public, and arguably most importantly, it's unfair to the victims and their families. While Kubrick did make the right decision in pulling his film from circulation while faced with his controversies, it unfortunately only further strengthened the belief that fictional media can be blamed for real-life crimes. Rather than attempt to blame the most recent violent form of media that was released, I think we should instead focus on the mental health of the criminal themselves. A Clockwork Orange, while extremely dark at times, was a great film, and an even greater work of art, and future directors should not hesitate from creating something similar in fear of being targeted for real-life crimes. As unfortunate as the statement is, violence is always going to be a part of our society. Blaming a movie, or a TV show, or a video game is an easy choice to make when faced with the fear of actually talking about the mental health issues of the population. Hopefully, the controversies surrounding A Clockwork Orange and other works of art like it over the years will help us in realizing that the mental health of a criminal has more to do with a crime than the piece of media that may or may not have inspired it.